Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning, JMC. How are y'all doing this morning? Good morning. Oh, yeah. Y'all sound like you're awake and ready to worship this morning. Let's stand up and praise the Lord together. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart sunday morning hallelujah and it's lasting all week long can you hear it can you feel it it's the rhythm of a gospel song oh won't you choose it you can't lose it Cause there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. When the valleys that I wander, turn the mountains that I can't climb. Oh, you are with me, never leave me. 
Cause there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy I've got an old church choir singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful I've got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy church choir singing in my soul i've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful i've got an old church choir singing in my soul i've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful i've got a heart overflowing because i've been restored there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy i've got an old church choir Singing in my soul, I've got a sweet salvation, and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing, cause I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Yes, no, nobody's going to steal our joy this morning, right? Yeah. Amen. Well, welcome to JMC. If this is your first time, we're so glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. If you're on Facebook, we'll welcome you as well. If this is your first time, we have an opportunity for you to connect with us. Just want to connect with you. You can go to, uh, you can email us at connect.jmexperience.org. We want to know, uh, want to know you. They want to know that you tune in, and if there's anything that we can pray for you, if you have any questions about our church, we can also answer them that way. Uh, welcome, and I hope you guys enjoyed the service today. Uh, here at JMC, we have life groups, and life groups are an opportunity for you guys to just do life with people around you. It just kind of brings it on a smaller, more personal level where you can connect and do life together, pray together, um, dive deeper into the Word together. And on February 21st, we're going to be having a virtual connect party. And during this virtual connect party, you'll be able to hop into different rooms online where you can meet leaders of different life groups, find out what kind of studies they do, if they have child care, when and where they meet things of that nature. So we invite you guys um, to attend that with us online. Um, be sure to check out our Facebook page for more details on how to get plugged into each room. Um, and then that way you guys can know which ones you want to hop in on. Um, and then on February 7th, in between services in the fellowship hall, we're going to have coffee and convo with our staff and with the pastors. And this is if you are new to JMC and you have not had the chance to personally meet Pastor Brandon or any of the staff members here at JMC. In between services, we invite you to come for coffee and conversation. And this is just to hear from Pastor Brandon a little bit about his vision and mission for JMC, as well as meet the leaders of different ministries that you may want to get plugged in on um, and then learn more about those different ministries. And we do ask that you RSVP um, to that one. So you can email connect at jmcexperience.org just so we can properly prepare for how many people are coming. Yes, and if you don't know who we are, that's my wife, Leslie. My name is Hugo. We do the youth ministry here at church. We meet on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8. So if you have a middle schooler or high schooler or no middle schooler or high schooler that would like to get plugged in, or that you think they need a little bit of Jesus, then bring them on Wednesday night. We have fellowship, we have uh, worship, and then we have Jesus. So it's a perfect mixture of things. Uh, the um, young men and women can get plugged in at church and need more about God. So uh, bring them in. We're going to have a great time. So as we continue our worship, we're going to worship God with our finances. And uh, you can use our app, you can use our website, or you can do it the old-fashioned way as you walk down the door. The ushers will be out in the back. If this is your first time here with us, please don't feel obligated to give. Uh, God has a message for you today, and that's the gift that we want to uh, give today. Um, so let's go uh, for God in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for every blessing. Uh, thank you for just providing this place to worship you and gather. Uh, God, we just, uh, as we continue our worship and we worship you with our finances, Father, I pray that uh, those, the gift comes from the abundance out of what you've given us. And, and we give with a cheerful heart, not with, out of obligation, but out of joy uh, for what you've given us. So, Father, as we give, uh, I pray that you bless the gift and the giver. I pray that you bless the gift. We multiply, they help us uh, further your kingdom here in our community, also beyond the borders, and for the giver that you bless them, God, above what they could ask or imagine. God, we love you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. the way that you
time I face the way I don't want to be afraid I don't want to be afraid and I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roar I don't want to fear the storm I don't want to fear the storm peace be still say the word Set my feet upon the sea till I'm dancing in the deep. Peace be still, you are here, so it is well. Even when my eyes can't see, I will trust the voice that speaks. I'm not gonna be afraid. Cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid And I'm not gonna fear the storm You are greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm No, I'm not gonna fear it all Peace be still Let 
Father, we welcome your presence in this place today. Believing and knowing your word when it says where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. We acknowledge your presence, Lord. A presence like no other. There's nobody like you, God. Thank you for every person that's here. It's not by accident. It's for a reason and for a purpose. And you said that when your word is spoken and it goes out, that it falls on different soil. Well, today I pray that you would prepare the soil of every person's heart and ears that is listening this morning. We consecrate this time to you. We devote it completely and wholly to you, asking you to speak to us where we need to be spoken to. We pray, as David said, that you would search us and know us, that you would cleanse us of any unrighteousness, anything that that separates what you want to do in our life from from you and, and where you want to take us. God, we pray that you would identify that. And God, we're thankful for that peace that surpasses all understanding, that you speak peace over your children, that you have favor and blessings over your children. And God, that even when we walk through the darkest valley, we will fear no evil, for we know that you are with us. And we honor you, Lord. We're excited about what you're going to do today, Lord. And we just pray right now that you would have your way in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Now, can we offer up an offering of praise for the worship team? Thank you, guys. And to Jesus, King Jesus, the name above all names, worthy of all praise and honor and glory and dominion to him. Bless the name of the Lord. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. Smile at somebody on your way down. Tell them they're looking lean and thin and healthy this morning. Well, we had an awesome, awesome uh, first service today. And I had a good crowd and um, so excited about what God's doing in our church. And I want to welcome all of you and our online guests who are tuning in right now. And, of course, um, those who are here in person. And then, um, you know, it's an honor and I'm a privilege to be able to to bring God's word each and every week, and God constantly reminds me of his faithfulness, and so uh, I hope you've been encouraged over the last 21 days as we've been fasting, and um, it's been a challenge, Uh, it's been tough at times, but uh, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, it's a promise, it's a principle in scripture, and he will honor your sacrifice, and uh, he he already has for many of you in many ways, and I'm believing that we're going to see the fruits of our labor uh, throughout the rest of this year. And how many know that God's going to take care of us? He's going to take care of his own. He's going to take care of his children. And so um, we're excited. So if you have your Bibles, I turn to Luke chapter 18. That's where I'm going to be reading from today. That's my, my assignment comes from Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> want to um, give a shout out to our parking team. No matter how cold or rainy or whatever it is, they are out there every Sunday. Can we just let them know how much we appreciate them? They're out there, rain, sunshine, snow, don't matter, they're there, and uh, we appreciate their their sacrifice and their their serving and and being a part of that. You know, Andy Stanley said the sermon starts in the parking lot, and so they represent our church from the parking lot, you know, and we care about our people and uh, your safety, and uh, so uh, we thank you to the the parking team. Uh, So Luke chapter 18, so... How many know this is going to be the shortest sermon in 2021 this morning? Because uh, lunch is next. No, I'm just kidding. Well, not really, but kind of. <laughs> Luke chapter 18. I have an assignment I want to share with you. Um, so we've been fasting the last 21 days. And we've been seeking God's face. It's been kind of a, um, it's been a sacrifice. It's been a time to slow down and to pray and to, to dive into the word and to seek God and and we have consecrated ourselves, and we have we have um, we've we've dedicated the first part of our year to some extent, saying, "God, I'm giving you my first, I'm giving you my best." And I thought about how really fasting is like an interruption, if you will. It's an interruption to our everyday routine of when we eat and how we eat and 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 who we interact with and who we hang out with, and and how it's really, in a sense, an interruption. It's an interruption into to our everyday schedule and our routine. And it's maybe something that many of you have tried for the first time this year. And I'm so honored and, and proud of you that you would join in. It's been a good reminder for us of what the most important thing in our life is. And that's our relationship with God. 
How many witnesses do I have that when you get your priorities right and you have, uh, you've cultivated your relationship with God, not in the sense that you earn his favor or, 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 or grace, you don't earn it, but in the sense that you, you, you talk with God and you spend time with God and you get more sensitive to his voice and you know when his presence is, is, is in a situation. And, so, and that's what happens when you separate yourself from, from, from worldly things and you seek God. Things begin to happen in your life. And it's a reminder that we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And when we make God the center of our life and the priority of our life, He has a way of taking care of every other area in our life. Can I get a witness? He knows what to do and how to bless you and how to hook you up and how to take care of you and provide what you need. Better than you know how to do it. And sometimes, sometimes, God does some of His best work in the middle of an interruption in our life. Sometimes God will interrupt. I love it. One person said this. God will wreck the plans that are going to wreck his children. God will interrupt things in our life that may seem uncomfortable, maybe things that we want to show us that he's God and that he has something better for us. Sometimes God will interrupt our schedule or our routine because he has something he wants to do in our life or in somebody else's life. That's the context of my story today. Or the story from scripture that I'm going to be pulling from in Luke chapter 18. Read with me and starting in verse 35, if you will. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 35. It says, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 40. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. I want to talk to you today on the title, if I had to put a title with my message, on divine interruptions. Divine interruptions. Because there are times in our life where God will interrupt what we want, what we're doing, and where we're at to get our attention and use us and speak to us. Interruptions are a good thing when God's in it. If God interrupts your plans, God has something better for you than your plans. In this particular story, Jesus is on his way to Jericho, the scripture teaches us, as he approached Jericho. Now, the funny thing and the, the, the crazy thing about Jesus is he was very popular. Jesus in that day was the T.D. Jakes of today. He was the Stephen Furtick of today. He was popular. He could preach. He was, he, was, he, was, he was well known as he began to preach and teach. In fact, his sermons were so fire and so good that people began to follow him whenever he got done preaching. Now that was acceptable then. That's, that's kind of creepy today, so don't do that. But the crowds would follow him around when he would preach. In fact, word got out that he was such a good speaker and preached with such anointing and such authority that they would wait for him upon his arrival. He was popular, he was influential, he was powerful. And the crazy thing is, is Jesus didn't have a cell phone, he didn't have Facebook, he didn't have Instagram, he didn't have TikTok, he didn't have Snapchat, he didn't have none of those things to promote himself. And yet Jesus' teaching was so powerful and so strong and word spread so quick that people would gather to follow him or wait for him before he got to a region. And did you know that his teaching was so powerful and so prominent that even the scholars of that day, which were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which would have been well-educated because you had to be well-educated in the law in order to become a Pharisee or Sadducee, that his teachings baffled them to the point they would ask him questions to try to stump him, and he would answer their question with a question, and they didn't know what to do with that. He knew what he was teaching. He knew what he was doing. He was popular. He chose 12 disciples to follow him and to break bread with him and to eat with him and to pray with him. But then even in those 12 disciples, he had the inner circle. And those were Peter, James, and John. His inner circle. Everybody needs an inner circle. People that, that you can have influence with and have influence with you. Yet, in all that he did, and as popular as he were, and as many places as he, as he went... When I read the Gospels, no matter how busy he was, Jesus made time for people. He made time for people. So often when Jesus would interact with people was when he was on his way somewhere. 
And this is how I know Jesus was holy and he and, and I'm not Jesus and I'm still a work in progress. Jesus always made time for people. How many know how aggravating it is whenever you're in a rush and you get stuck behind somebody that's just taking a, a, a joy ride through the, the, the county or the country somewhere and you're trying to get to a meeting that you got to, you're already late for and you got to get there and you just can't get there in time. You know, you've been fasting for 20 days and you're trying to get to work and where they got donuts waiting for you that you don't even know why. No, that coworker never brings donuts and you're fasting. They brought donuts for the whole team and you're, you're late and you're trying to get there. It's an interruption. And Jesus made time for people on his journey going where he was going to do what he was going to do. The Bible says that as he approached Jericho, that implies that he was headed somewhere, that he had an agenda that he had a purpose, that he had something on his mind, that he had an assignment for his life that he had to accomplish and he had to do. And when I read that, it got me thinking. You know, we've been fasting the, 20, the 21 days, the first part of this year, and we've been praying and we've been seeking God. And so many times people think that that's kind of where we draw the line, but it's to set our feet on the right path, to set the course of our life and our destiny, to seek God all the days of our life and every day of the year, not just the first 21 days, and to put God first and make Him a priority. It's to set the course of our life. And I got to thinking how Jesus, he, he, he modeled that and how he set the course and he, he prayed to the Father and he made people a priority in his life to the point that it got me thinking that we should never be so busy doing, doing, doing that we overlook the very people that God put right in front of us to minister to. That we don't get so busy trying to accomplish this and this task and this and that. That we overlook the people that God might put in our path that seem like an interruption but that need a breakthrough that God's going to use through us to give it to them. What I'm trying to say is that if we ever overlook souls, we've lost our sight. Every person has a name. Every name has a story. Every person, every story, every name represents a soul. That's why when the church grows and we see people coming in and they hear the gospel and they, they see something shift in their life and they start seeking God, it represents a story. It represents a soul. And we can't be so busy doing, doing, doing that we overlook the people God put right in front of us, the children God put right in front of us. If we ever overlook people, we've lost our purpose. One of the last things Jesus told his disciples was, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In, other, in, other, in order to make disciples, which a disciple is a follower of Christ, you have to have relationship. You have to know people. So my question is, is there room in my schedule for godly interruptions? Interruptions that God wants to use to make a difference in my life or in someone else's. The truth is, listen, nothing shows people that we value them more than when we take the time to help them and care for them. Sometimes your presence is the most powerful thing you can give somebody. Sometimes your presence is the most powerful thing you can give somebody. Jesus, before he left to go back to the Father, made this statement. He said, it's expedient that I go. That word means important, of utmost importance. In fact, I'm hastily ready to go because Jesus was one person and can only be at one place at one time. He says, but when I go, the Father's going to send the comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. And so now when you get born again and you get saved, then the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you. And so now the Spirit of God is all over this room, not just in one place. And you take it with you when you leave to your job site, to your school, to your workplace. And now you have the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead living in you. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is His presence, and there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the presence of Jesus. There's nothing like the presence of God when you're having a late night breakdown and you're going through something. You just turn on some worship music and you begin to pray and you just you just sense His presence and know everything's going to be all right. And if there's many of you in this room who know exactly what I'm talking about, when you're going through a season, you're wondering how it's going to work, and you just start opening up and talking to God, and you have this overwhelming feeling that everything's going to be not just all right; it's going to be more than all right. There's nothing like his presence. If we neglect people or everybody in our life, we overlook the same people that Jesus would have stopped to help. It's easy to become so busy that we neglect people, and sometimes those people can be the ones that are closest to us, our closest friends and our closest family. In fact, the Bible says in Psalms 46 and 10, be still and know that I am God. So, if you find yourself busy with the wrong priorities, if your focus is out of line, if your 
figuratively speaking, if your life is out of alignment, if it's not, your priorities are off, I want to give you a four-point remedy to help you get back on track. Now, I ain't going to preach long, so if you're going to jump in and shout and get excited, you got to do that early. If not, sit there, I'm going to preach it, and I'm going to eat lunch. Number one, if you need to readjust your priorities, if you need to realign and refocus, you have to first, everybody say, admit it. Admit it. The first step is to acknowledge that something isn't right in your life if you won't change. You ask any addict, the first step they have to come to is they have to acknowledge, I need help. I can't do this on my own. It's admitting it. In fact, and when you think of addiction, you think of drugs, but people are addicted to more than just drugs. There are people that are addicted to people's opinions about them, and that's called codependency. There are people who are addicted to, to work or to doing this or to doing that, and that's called idolatry. That's, that's, that's an idol. So there's all kinds of addictions that people, that people have that represent what they give themselves to. And if you want to have change in your life, you have to have an awareness, some awareness about the change that you want in your life. If you overlook stuff, it doesn't fix it. If your car is ticking and making a funny noise, just because you turn the radio up and overlook it, don't mean it's going to go get better. You can't, you have to expose and reveal the areas in your life that you need help if you expect God to fix it and help you. And so, listen, do you ever wonder why we pray every Sunday the sinner's prayer? Every Sunday we pray, we pray, forgive us of our sins. You know, we pray, um, I, I, I confess you as Lord. We pray, I believe Jesus came and he died and he rose again. Do you know why we do that? Because Romans 10, 9 through 8 says, if you declare with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. Here it is, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So profess means to confess. It means to acknowledge it. It means to proclaim it. It means to uh, uh, admit it. And you have to admit if there's areas in your life where you need adjustments, you have to first admit it. Can I tell you that relationships in our life are like bridges that connect us one to another? Our relationships are like bridges that connect us to your husband, to your wife, to your children, to your family. And sometimes those lanes of communication get clogged and thorns begin to grow over that bridge and, and thistles and thorns and briars. And what happens is those bridges become overgrown with thorns, thorns of distraction, thorns of work, thorns of habits, thorns of hobbies, uh, until our communication lines are clogged and neglect becomes part of our everyday routine. You've got to have communication. You've got to have those lanes secured and clear so that you can love one another and give to one another and help one another. And, and we can't be so caught up in routine that our relationships suffer. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he loses his soul, if he loses his family, if he loses his calling, if he loses his church, if he loses his anointing? We've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to cultivate those relationships. And the people that God has put in our life are for a reason. It's for a reason. And so every day is a gift from God. Good friends are a gift from God. Your family is a gift from God. Listen, a good job is a gift from God. Money in your pocket is a gift from God. If you are wealthy, it's a gift from God. And if you got 20 bucks and that's all you got, it might not seem like a gift, but it's a gift from God. It's a gift. Every day, a good family, a, a wife, the Bible says the man who finds a wife finds a good thing. A husband, those are gifts from God. Did you know that working is worship? Work, work and a good job is a gift from God. Listen to this, Proverbs 12 and 11. Those who work with their hand will have an abundance of food. Thank God for food, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Listen to this, this is funny. But those who are, but, but, but the desires of the diligent, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But those who chase fantasies have no sense. I butchered that, food got on my mind, let me start over. The Bible says in Proverbs 12 and 11, those who work their land will have an abundance of food. But those who chase fantasies have no sense. He so said, if you chase fantasies, you got, you got no sense. But if you work your land, you will have an abundance of food. Look at this, Proverbs 13 and 4. A sluggard's appetite is never filled. 
but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. What does that mean? If you have a desire and you're diligent, it says your desires will be fully satisfied. Now let's have good desires in Jesus' name. But it's fully satisfied. But it says if you're a sluggard, your appetite is never filled. What's a slug? It's slow and slimy and, and, and doesn't do hardly anything. I don't want to be a slug. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 5 and 8. It's addressing the elders and, and, and how elders in the church should take care of the widows and the people who, have, who are lacking. But right in the middle of it, he throws in verse 8 and listen to what he says. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 5 and 8. What am I saying? God honors those who work hard. God honors those who work hard. When we work hard and we do it with the right attitude and we provide for our family and we go out there and we hustle and we do it with the right attitude, that honors God. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with stuff. Nothing wrong with working hard. Nothing wrong with being proud of what you earned as long as it doesn't consume you and that becomes where your identity lies. Let me show you something. No, even though God honors hard work, it's important to know that it's important that our work is worship and that we don't worship our work. It's important that our work is worship. You see the difference? And we don't worship our work. One person said, don't be so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. Because you know what's worth more than a paycheck? The people you love knowing that you care about them and your presence. Your presence means the most. Your presence in their life. We all know what it's like to have somebody there for us when we're going through a tough time. And at that moment, it's not a, it's not a materialistic thing they can give us that makes the difference. It's having somebody there to talk to and to empathize and to sympathize and to understand why. Because there's no substitute for presence in our life. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. There's no substitutes for His presence. The man in this story cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. What did he do? He admitted there was a need. He said, I need, have mercy on me. At least just stop. At least just talk to me. At least do what only you can do. He, he admitted his need, and Jesus sent out an order to bring him, and he received his miracle. That raised a question. What is God waiting on me to do and admit before he gives the order on my behalf? What is God waiting for you to admit that you need help in, an area you need help in, before he gives the order to bring you to the front of the line and do what he needs to do in your life? Just a, just a question. So you first admit it. Everybody say stop it. stop it. The second thing you do if you want to get your priorities in order after you admit it is stop it. Stop the wrong things. Stop the things that are pulling your joy and sucking your, the life out of you and, and robbing you of your peace. Starting today, I want you to identify areas in your life that are keeping you distracted from your main purpose and your main goal. Because the truth is, if the devil can't keep you, can't, can't defeat you, he will keep you distracted. If he can't get you to quit, and he can't get you to give in, and he can't get you to give up, he will distract you until you're off course, your priorities are wrong, and you're back in a routine, and, he's, and, and you're no longer operating effectively in the kingdom. He will distract you. And all of us get distracted by something. He knows what buttons to push. Is something stealing your joy or your peace? Stop it. Does that sound ruthless? So is the clock. It's ticking and your health matters. Your health matters. Your purpose matters. Your destiny matters. I want to tell somebody that you can't sit on every committee. You can't attend every single meeting. You can't fix everybody's problems. Even Jesus couldn't be everywhere at one time. You have got to draw lines and set boundaries and focus on what God's called you to do. Not overlooking people, but definitely not overextending yourself to do what God's called you to do. Identify some things in your life that you need to stop and start today. An interruption in our agenda may be the very thing that God uses to get us where he needs us to be. An interruption in our everyday schedule may be the very thing God's going to use to get us on the right track. Verse 39, look at this. The people uh, rebuked him. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him, be quiet. I love this. But he shouted all the more. Sometimes you just got to shout louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. 
And the Bible says the people had rebuked him. And he could have let them stop him from receiving what God had in store for him. He, they rebuked him. They said, sit over there. You've always been a blind man, a beggar. You're always going to be in that. They labeled him. People label us sometimes. You know, maybe your parents or your, your people you grew up with. Or, you know, maybe you've let the enemy label you. This is how you'll always be. But what you've got to do is press on beyond what people think and what people say. And listen to, look at who's passing by. And his name is Jesus. And he can revolutionize your life like he did this man's life. And he shouted all the louder, son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus called him to the front of the line. He stopped. What did he do? He stopped allowing others to keep him from what Jesus had in store for him. He said, I don't care what they say about me. I don't care what they labeled me. In fact, I don't care so much that I'm going to shout over their, their rumors and over their lies and over their, 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 their scrutiny and all those things. And I'm going to call out to the one who can make a difference. He stopped it. He stopped it. What do you need to stop? Number three, everybody say maintain it. You have to admit it. You have to stop it. And you have to maintain it. The truth is... Anybody can start something. It's those who finish that reap the benefits. The truth is, everybody wants the final product, but not the hard work it takes to achieve it. The truth is, everybody wants the trophy, but not the countless hours of blood, sweat, and tears it took to stand up where everybody sees the final product and the final show. The truth is, everybody wants the reward, but not the sacrifice. Can I tell you something? It costs something to walk with God. It, it takes times on your knees of praying and begging and crying out. It takes times of saying, God, I don't know what you're doing or where you're at, but I trust you anyway. Because the purest oil comes from the grape that's crushed the most. And the finest wine comes from the grape that's squished the most. And God brings out the best in us when the worst of things happen to us. And so, and so it, it's easy to start out strong. It's easy to start out strong and fade quickly. But... It costs something. It takes times of prayer. It takes intentionality. It takes reading. It takes spending time in God's presence. It takes something to have an anointing. It takes something for, for God to bring something out of you. Sometimes things have to happen to you. The, the, the purest gold goes through the hottest furnace to purify it. Wine comes from grapes that are crushed and stomped on and mashed. Oil comes from olives that are pressed. And crushed. And it's easy to, when you get saved, things are good and start going good. But God's looking for people who are committed and say, I'm going to trust the process. And I'm going to not just trust the process. I'm going to trust whose hands I hold through the process. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil. For your rod and your staff comfort me. No matter what I face, no matter what I come up against, I didn't ask for it. But God, I'm going to trust you because you're going to use everything for my good. Everything, what I wanted to happen, what I didn't want to happen, what I thought was going to happen that didn't, and what I wanted to happen that did, all of it works together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's a promise. That's a principle. Nothing's wasted with God. I love that the Bible says this man shouted, and when the people rebuked him, he shouted even louder. He was not going to let the one who could change everything pass him by because somebody else thought he was crazy or a nobody or not good enough. Sometimes when you walk with the Lord, people might think you're crazy. People might think you're crazy for giving 10%. People might think you're crazy for serving. People might think you're crazy for going to church every Sunday. People might think you're crazy for believing that God's going to come through when nothing looks like anything's coming through. But that's what happens when you have crazy faith and you trust a God who does crazy things for you is he shows up and shows out and he gets the glory for what he does in your life. And, he, and, and it's not by might nor by strength, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, is what the scripture says. There are things that God does so that no man can get the glory for what he's done. No man can take credit for my anointing and my gift. Only God has cultivated that. No man can take credit for what he's doing in your life. Only God can take credit for that. It's seeking the face of God. He says he shouted all the more louder. He wasn't going to let what somebody said about him rob him of his destiny. You can't let what somebody said about you rob you of your destiny. You can't let what somebody labeled you rob you of who. Just because that's what they labeled you don't mean that that's what God calls you. The Apostle Paul told the Galatians, 
you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion doesn't come from the one who called you in reference to God. Galatians 5, 7 through 8. What I'm telling you, church, is if God has put a dream in your heart, once you've cut the distractions, run the race God has called you to run. Now, I want to tell you something. You can't run in your lane if you're looking at everybody else's lane. Now, that will preach right there by itself the end. You can't run the race and the lane God's called you to run looking and comparing at what everybody else has done. In the 2016 Olympics, South African uh, swimmer Klo, Che Lo Klo, I can't pronounce his name, was up against Michael Phelps in the 200-meter butterfly uh, swim. They were coming in on the home stretch, and there's a picture that illustrates what it looks like. And when you're not looking at where you're supposed to be going and you're looking in somebody else's lane, you see who's in the lead. God has not called us to look at our neighbor, look at our neighbor's wife, look at our neighbor's husband, and compare and look and see what they got that I don't. God's given you your husband and your wife and your family and your children, and God expects you to cultivate those relationships and do what he's called you to do and run in your lane. Everybody's anointing is different. Everybody's calling is different. And I don't want to be the guy looking at somebody else and thinking, what? I want what they got. No, God has an own assignment for my life than he has for them. You know, if we're being honest, you know, it's easy. You know, I can find myself saying, do I preach like that person? Do I preach like that? Do I lead like that person? Do I lead my church or my staff? Or, you know, and I find it's easy to start comparing. And if pastors are honest, they'll tell you they look at this church and they'll look at that. And and it's easy to get soaked in. But God has not called us to compare. Because let me tell you something. Comparison robs creativity. And comparison robs the uniqueness and the gifts and the talents God has disposed and deposited in us. And so when we compare, we we are saying, God, you must not have given me what you thought I need. You must have given it to them. And God says, no, I've given you everything that you need. I've deposited every gift, every talent, everything that you need to do what I've called you to do and to get you there and succeed doing it. That's the God that we serve. I'm not going to compare. You know, it's easy. You know, you... I said in the first service, you... My wife don't look like that. My husband, he don't look quite like that. I'm thinking... You're thinking it. I'm just saying it. Well, you know... You know, I told him in the first service, I said, you know, you bring your kids to church. Why don't my kids act like that? You bring your kids to church. You got them in church. You drug them to church. And they're acting like hellions. And and this family over here seems to have everything. They don't even go to church. You're like, God, what in the world is going on? No, you don't see the bigger picture. And if you train up a child in the way they should go, when they're old, they will not depart. Seeds are being deposited. It doesn't matter what it looks like over there. You're not called to run their lane. You're called to run your lane and raise those babies and raise those children and love your wife no matter what it looks like. If you made a covenant and a commitment, then that's your assignment. It's your assignment. It's good to me. It's good to me. It's good to me. I can't be as great of a speaker, one of the greatest speakers in the world, I think, T.D. Jakes. I love I love T.D. Jakes. Jensen Franklin, my favorite pastor. I, as bad as I want to be them, I cannot fulfill the assignment God has, has on my life trying to be them. God made me the way he made me, and God made you the way he made you. You know, the Bible says we're his masterpiece, crafted by the master's hand in the image of God. I would hate to look at a masterpiece that the master craftsman made and say, there's something wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you. We are uniquely made and purposed for a reason. Not to compare So we're to maintain. How do I maintain? I keep praying. I keep running. I keep giving. I keep serving. I keep seeking. I keep knocking. And when God does something in your life, people will see it. The band, you guys can come. I'm I'm almost done. Number four, everybody say share it. So if you want the right priorities in your life, and you would say, hey, there's something a little bit off. You know, I'm out of alignment. I need to refocus. There's some things that I need to get right. The first thing you have to do is admit it. God, I need your help in this area. 
The second thing you have to do is stop it. Stop the things that are not right. Stop the things that are robbing you of your joy, robbing you of your peace. The third thing you have to do is maintain it. Start out strong and finish strong. You'll have good days and bad days. Seek God on the good days and seek God more on the bad days. Seek God when you seem to find Him and seek God when you can't figure out where in the world His hand is at in your life. When you can't trust God's hand, you can trust God's heart. When you can't trace His hand, you can trace His heart. And God's drawing people to say, hey, I'm going to trust the process, and I'm not just going to trust the process. I'm going to trust whose hand is in my hand walking me through this season of my life. God expects you to fight for that marriage. Now, it takes two to tango in more ways than one. Half of you get that on the way home. But if you made a commitment and a vow before God to that spouse, that's your assignment. Now, it takes two working at it. If one works and one don't, you, you can't do but so much with that. If you're doing everything you can and you're praying and you're going to church and you're seeking God and it's not being reciprocated, you pray and you, you, you get counseling, you do, there's grace. There's grace on grace on grace. That song by David Crowder, if his grace was an ocean, we're all sinking in it. There's grace. But if you've got two people that are struggling and they're both fighting, fight together. Fight together. So you, 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 you admit it, you stop it, you maintain it, and then you share it. Most of the time when Jesus would stop, his disciples would stop too. If Jesus stopped, his disciples would stop. There's a couple of occasions, like this, the woman at the well, he sent his disciples into town, but they came back. When Jesus would stop somewhere, his disciples would stop. What is the scripture teaching us? It's teaching us that when others see us get our priorities in order, it makes them want to do the same thing. Let me help you. When others see your family and God's hand on your family and God's touch on your family, it makes them desire and yearn what it is you have. Well, pastor, you just told me not to compare. It's not comparing. What you're doing is you, let me help you. You look at their family. Somebody sees your family. You're going to church. You're praying. And everything's not perfect, but it's obvious that God's hand's on your life. It makes them want what you have, not what you have. It makes the, and so now they say, God, I, help me to have your spirit and, and your hand on my life the way they do. I, don't, I may not get there the way that family got there, but you have a direct assignment and a lane for me and my family to go in. And I want to get to know you and my family so that my family can start a, generational, a generation of blessings and favor so that my kids see prayer and their kids see prayer and my kids see giving and their kids see giving. And it starts, it's a process. God's a generational God. And if you haven't had that, there's good news. It can start with you right here today. It's not that you want what they have and the stuff they have or, or even how they got it. It's that you say, hey, there's something, that family, there's something about them. God, what is it you want to do in my life that will make me have an impact? You share it. So I want to I tell somebody this. Everybody in here influences somebody. Right now, Everybody listening, on, listening online and in this room, you're influencing somebody by the way you talk, by the way you react, by the way you respond, by the things that you do. People, whether you know it or not, people are watching you and listening and you have influence in their life. Somebody on your job, somebody on the job site, somebody at your workplace, somebody in your office, Somebody on your team, somebody in near your cubicle, somebody near your desk, some boss who's struggling with their faith and struggling, looking at you. They're supposed to lead you corporately, but they're looking at you because you don't even know it. You're leading them spiritually. Every person has influence to some degree. Why? We are influencers. And when we get our priorities in order, people notice. Let me show you. This man was desperate, and he called out to Jesus, and Jesus had him brought forward. Let's start in verse 40. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. This is after he cried out. This is after he, he admitted, I have a problem. 
he stopped it by, he said, I'm going to stop laying by the side of this road and begging and I'm blind. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to, I'm going to maintain it. I'm not just going to start strong. I'm not just going to yell one time if he comes, I'm going to, I'm going to give up. Or if he, if he doesn't come, I'm going to give up. He says, no, I'm going to yell louder and I'm going to stop the labels that have been placed on me. And then he says, I'm going to share it. Watch this. It says, Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Look at this. Don't miss it. Verse 43. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. Don't miss this last part. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. He's the only one who got his sight that day. But when he started praising God, it was contagious. Your passion and your purpose and your faith is contagious for other people to see it. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. That's the kind of pastor I want to be. That's the kind of preacher I want to be. That's the kind of church I want to be. That when people come in, there's a drawing by the Spirit. Is Hey, there's freedom there. And the Spirit moves there. And something shifts in the atmosphere of my life when I go there. And that's what it's about. And it says they started praising God because he received his miracle. It's contagious, church. So, did you know that your breakthrough, your passion, and your purpose is contagious? But if your priorities are out of order, you admit it, you stop it, you maintain it, and you share it. If you'll stand with me, I'm going to close. So, what are your priorities? What are your priorities? I want to give them to you. You've heard the acronym JOY, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. I'm going to kind of follow in that, but I'm not using, I'm not using JOY. I'm using something different. It's not an acronym either. Number one, God. Your priorities are in this order, God. Then comes your family. And your family kind of falls in the category of others, which is now number three, others. So your family and others can really be tied into one. So God, your family, others, and then yourself. The funny thing is, our culture is counterintuitive in that it tells us to put ourselves first, get what we can get, look after you, make sure you're happy, and then, you know, your family, may, they might get a little bit of your time, they might get a little bit, or other people, you know, you might do something special or out of the way for them. And, and then God's kind of a 911 operator, last resort, help! That's the kind of culture we live in. But God's raising up a a remnant in the kingdom of people who say, I'm going to put God at the center of my life, no matter what people say about me or what I hear or what I see. And when God's at the center of my life, I'm going to look after the other people and put them ahead of myself. And that includes my family and some of my close friends. And then then I'm going to look after me. I'm going to take care of myself because the Bible says the last shall be first. And it says, when you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. And so God honors those. God has a way of taking care of you when you take care of others. That's what I'm trying to say. So God, family, others, and yourself. Once you get all of that in order, be ready to share with others your experience. Because there's a lot of busy people running here, running there, meeting this, meeting that, doing this, doing that. They have no peace. Why? Their priorities are out of order. And they may look to you and you show them how to admit I need help. Admit I need some realignment. I want to stop some things in my life that's not healthy for me, not healthy for my marriage, not healthy for my calling. I want to maintain some things. I want to maintain this, this, this desire to seek God and hunger for God that we've been on for the last three weeks. I want to maintain this all year long. And then I want to share it with somebody. Because I'm called to go and make disciples, to share the gospel. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to pray for you. And then I want to pray with you. Father, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. I thank you for every person watching online. I thank you for your presence that's in this room. I thank you, Lord, that, that you see us and you know us. And as David said, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for thee. God, we long for more of you. We long for more of your presence in our lives personally. But God, I just, as the, as the head of the church, I declare we long for more of your presence in our worship, in our, in our preaching, in our, in our services. 
God, that you would open the floodgates and do what only you can do in, in, our, in, in the midst of us, God, among us. God, that spiritual chains will begin to fall and oppression will begin to leave and, and, and freedom would flow through our veins and in our life by the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for those who are here today and watching online. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, maybe they've lost count. But God, something in them has resonated. Something in them has shifted. Something in them has stirred their heart. They're asking, am I really somebody? Do I matter? How do I mean? I don't want a roller coaster relationship. I want to run steady. I want to run the race you've marked out for me. Maybe somebody here and you're like that swimmer looking over at Michael Phelps and you're comparing. You're comparing your marriage. You're comparing your husband. You're comparing your wife. You're comparing your job. You're comparing your whatever. You're comparing. You have what you have. God will only bless you according to what you do with what you have. Or maybe you're here and you've got sin in your life. And you would say, Pastor, pray for me. I got some things I need to make right. I need to commit my heart and my life to God. Or maybe you're here and you would be honest and say, Hey, Pastor, I just need, to, I need some realignment in my life, in my marriage, in my family. Nobody looking around. Nobody's here to embarrass you. Would you just be honest and lift up an honest hand and say, That's me. Pray for me, Pastor. That's me. You're talking to me. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for being honest. Here's what I'm going to do. I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me. I finished a little early. We're going to sing the bridge and worship for just a few couple of minutes, and then we're going to go to lunch, all right? I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I need your grace. By faith, I receive your grace. Forgive me and use me. I believe in Jesus. He came. He died, and he rose again. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your purpose in my life. Thank you for choosing me and knowing me. I receive all that you have for me. Everything that you have for me, I want it. I submit myself to you. Use me for your glory. Realign me reprioritize my life. Use me for your glory and for my good. There's no turning back. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give them a hand clap of praise, an offering of worship? Can we jump in on that bridge and just worship for a minute? Just another 60 seconds or two minutes. We just lift, if you're comfortable, we just lift your hands as a sign of surrender. Pretend there's nobody here but you and Jesus. He knows your need. He knows. Just worship. Sing this to him. You walked through all of my walls and you conquered my shame. Stepped into my past, filled my world. There's no shame and no guilt for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's faithful. You don't have to come. But you always do.
you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. We worship you, Lord. You show up in splendor and change the whole room. We thank you, Lord. Can we put our hands together one more time? He's worthy. He can shift the atmosphere. He can shift your life. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Well, God bless you. I hope you have a great week. Hope you enjoy lunch today. Uh, Don't overdo it, all right? We'll see you next Sunday. Smile at somebody on your way out. God bless you. We love you.